Apologies for that. This meeting is being recorded. Great. So Professor Bessner is an intellectual historian of U.S. foreign relations and also the co-host of the, I would say, excellent podcast, American Prestige. He is a non-resident fellow at the Quincy Institute for Responsible Statecraft, and in 2019 through 2020, he served as the foreign policy advisor for Bernie Sanders' presidential campaign. He is the author of Democracy in Exile, Hans Speyer, The Rise of the Defense Intellectual. We have also Professor Megan Black, who's an associate professor of history at MIT. She is the historian of U.S. environmental management and foreign relations in the late 19th and 20th centuries. She is the author of the award-winning The Global Interior, Mineral Frontiers, and American Power. And Professor Black has published articles and review essays in the Journal of American History, Modern American History, Diplomatic History, and American Quarterly. And her new book, which is, I think, a really exciting project, follows this community in Colorado who battled a powerful international corporation intent on blasting through their mountain in search of a mineral of increasing importance to 1970s globalization. And last, we have uh, Professor Monica Kim. Professor Kim is an associate, is the associate professor of history uh, and the William Appleman Williams and David G. and Marion S. Meisner Chair in U.S. International and Diplomatic History at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Her scholarship analyzes a fundamental practice used by the United States during the era of formal decolonization in the global war, Cold War, wars of intervention. So uh, her first book is the, the Interrogation Rooms of the Korean War, The Untold History. And her current project, The World That Made, that, sorry, The World That Hunger Made, The Koreas, the United States, and Afro-Asia, tackles another subject traditionally in the purview of Cold War foreign policy and warfare, which is development. Um, I also want to take the opportunity again to congratulate Professor Kim on being named a MacArthur Fellow. So if you have the uh, clap your hands emoji, now's the time to use it. Okay, so the idea for our panel, uh, I think, is really to examine how U.S. global power was forged and how it reinforced, uh, how the country reinforced its superpower status. So for those who don't know, Henry Luce, the titan of uh, American popular magazines like Life and Time, uh, declared in 1941 that Americans were, uh, quote, called each to his own measure of capacity and each in the wise horizon of his vision to create the first great American century. So for Luce, the American form, this American foreign policy would be one that is going to pursue global dominance and even better, unchallenged global dominance. And I think our goal then for the panel is to better understand the structures that created that American century and also how that's been challenged. I think today we're at a really fascinating part of uh, the history of US power, both in terms of current events and in the academic and public work that historians are producing on the history of empire and diplomatic history. So in current events, we have the election of Donald Trump, the US tearing up deals like the Iran nuclear deal, the Taliban taking back control of Afghanistan, profound inequality at home, and China's alternative to US-centered liberal democratic capitalism. And that all suggests a potential collapse to the sinews and structures uh, that the American century was built on. So in, in his example, one of our panelists, Daniel Bessner for Empire Burlesque and Harper's, plainly states that the American century is over and that we need a new model of restraining foreign policy that will be crucial in managing that transition. I think by contrast, liberal interventionists highlight the potential resilience of the structures of American power, even as it fades today. They might point to how NATO has seen a real resurgence in Europe after Russia's invasion of Ukraine. And they argue that global public opinion of the US as the world's leading power has actually rebounded post-Trump. Uh, for example, strong majorities across key countries in the global South, uh, including Brazil, Egypt, India, Mexico, Nigeria, all state that they would prefer US global leadership compared to China. This was in a recent EGF poll. Uh, in the Philippines, a country that saw some of the worst American imperial violence, policing, exploitation, torture, uh, today 75% still say that the US military is a good thing for the country. So while our goal today is to better grasp the history of how the US used these different structures and actors to achieve global hegemony, I think we also want to understand to what degree the American century is over and why some remain reluctant to fully embrace its end. As I mentioned earlier, I see this as a very turbulent period of US foreign relations, but also a great place where uh, work has flourished on how the American century was made. 
Uh, Daniel Immervar's How to Hide an Empire brought many readers to the unseen elements of power creation, with uh, guano islands and screw thread standards becoming unlikely pillars of the US's pointless empire. So our speakers work likewise, I think, capture different conceptions of the making of power with interrogators and POWs shaping decolonization and the idea of intervention as a key diplomatic tool. Uh, miners and administrators redirecting the flows of strategic minerals and dramatically remaking the environment itself. Or defense intellectuals constructing the military and intellectual complex that guides policy formation in Washington and elsewhere. So now let's turn to our panel to hear their thoughts on the structure of the American century and where it stands today. And we'll begin with opening statements from Professor Bessner and then conversation. And then we'll obviously have time for questions from the audience. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Aaron. Uh, and thank you, Aaron, for organizing this event. And I'd also like to uh, say uh, thank you to my panelists, my fellow panelists, Monica and Megan, for doing it. And it's good because I will go first and I will be the least. So it'll th just get better from here on out. Um, so like like Aaron said, that of course, the, the phrase the American century began in a very particular context. Specifically, it was published by Henry Luce in 1941, February 1941, before the United States had entered World War II, but after it had begun to aid allies, to describe this new project that Luce envisioned um, for the United States in the moment of its advent to globalism, rise to globalism, what have you. Um, and I think this is important to talk about right at the very beginning, because the American century, uh, century like most terms we use, is, 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 not, is not clear. It's actually quite opaque in instances. Uh, and in particular, I think the American century has been used to refer to two specific things. Um, one, which is the ideological pro, uh, project of the United States, the idea that the United States represented a particular approach to modernity, that it represented a particular vision of the good life, and, and that the United States would effectively fulfill its historical capital H destiny and spread this way of life around the world. And I think that's really what Luce was talking about. So in my um, article, Empire Burlesque, that Aaron mentioned, when I use the term American century, and when I said the American century is over, what I really meant is this ideological project. Um, as I do more and more thinking, I'm writing on Fukuyama right now, and I'm revisiting this whole idea, it, it almost seems like we're entering a post-ideological age. If, if the 20th century was an era defined by struggle between so-called great ideologies, it just seems today that that pure power and pure material matter far more than ideas. Um, I was just thinking about it the other day. It, to me, it's it's hard to imagine for so, that someone would die for liberalism in a way that they might have in the 20th century, but that that's just, just my understanding and neither here nor there, but only to say that I do think the American century as an ideological project is over. People might want American goods, they might want American military protection, but I don't think they truly believe in the quote unquote American capital P project. But the other way that people use to refer to the American century um, is, is a, what I would refer to, broadly speaking, as a material security project, the, the pointillist empire that Daniel Immervar spoke about in his How to Hide an Empire, um, the, the armed primacy, the grand strategy of armed primacy that Stephen Wartime has mentioned. Uh, and this American century, that is the literal sinews of power, to borrow the phrase from an old John Brewer book, um, I think continues to exist and, and very much so. Um, and I also think that uh, talk of a new multipolarity, the, the emergence of a new multipolar world is really, is really, um, open to question. But that isn't to say that American power has changed, because I think it really has. And I think in particular, two transformational events that occurred in the last half decade, 10 years or so, have really begun to reshape the United States' place in the world. First is the election of Donald Trump. And, and I'm on record as saying that I actually think Trump was far more of, um, when it comes to sort of the structure of American capitalism and American empire, he, he represented far more continuity than change. Uh, though nevertheless, I do think uh, Trump's leaving things like the World Health Organization, the Paris Climate Agreement, the Iran nuclear deal, the Intermediate Range Nuclear Forces Treaty, and the Open Skies Treaty 
Society, just to name a few, did suggest that the architecture of the so-called liberal international order, um, which really, you know, how liberal, how international, how how orderly was it, we could get into, but that those structures are are genuinely not as robust as they once were. And I do think U.S. allies um, in particular now question to what degree they could rely on the United States. And I don't think Ukraine necessarily has changed that. I think Ukraine has proven that American weapons manufacturers are still going to send weapons around the world. Um, but I don't think it, 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 it has demonstrated to European leaders that the, the U.S. of the 1960s, 70s, 80s, and 90s is, is back, that something still has changed. Um, and then and second, and I think this is the most important um, issue geopolitically, is that the quote unquote emergence or rise, I don't love using those sorts of cyclical language, but uh, just for common sense, but I just want to highlight that there are problems with that, those terms. But the so-called emergence of China, of China as an economic and military powerhouse has in a real, in a real way ended the so-called unipolar moment, which is the only uh, United States uh, that I have experienced, you know, post Cold War, the United States was a genuine unipolar hegemon that I think it is not quite anymore in the same way. I, 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 for one, don't think that the United States is just for pure material reasons going to be able to dominate East Asia in particular, like it has for the past 70 or so years, broadly speaking. Um, so to me, those are the big transformations of, of the moment, the, the end of the American century as an ideological project, but the continuation of the American century as a material project, even if this material project remains diminished, particularly given the United States relative pure power position, which it's just the United States is just not going to be what it was in 1945 or 1991. Those were incredibly unique circumstances, unlikely to be repeated. Um, and I'll, I'll just close on this. I think one of the big problems that we have is that policymakers in Washington, D.C. in particular, are just unwilling to accept either of these transformations, the diminution of both the American project as uh, the American century as an ideological project and its relative diminution as a material project. And I fear that the inability to um, understand and appreciate these two realities will engender rather disastrous policy outcomes over the next 10 or 15 years. So there's more to say, but I will end. Always better to talk less than to talk more. Thank you. Okay, I think it's over to me now. Uh, thank you, Danny, for those comments. And I relish the opportunity, like you mentioned, to think alongside you too, but also Aaron for organizing us. So yeah, huge thanks to Monica and Danny and Aaron for the whole ordeal. Um, okay, so for my particular keyhole onto this story, the institutions, ideas, and actors relating to the environment have formed key sinews um, in keeping with this sinews of power theme. And I think in a warming world, environment has become a helpful fulcrum, fulcrum, an important fulcrum for evaluating imperial legacies. Um, so I will admit that the present, I think, informs the questions we're asking about US empire and imperial legacies, and I anticipate that might continue. Um, so as we know, the Paris Climate Accord set out internationally recognizable sets of targets to prevent the most catastrophic version of planetary warming, um, hoping to keep it to less than two degrees Celsius, though, you know, we, we know the aspirational target of less than 1.5 degrees Celsius and grim recent reports suggest that that is um, a pipe dream. Yet as world leaders attempt to meet these targets, the histories of empire consistently form these stumbling blocks. So leaders in the global South have justly foregrounded the asymmetries tied to colonialism. Many nations in the global North have been primary beneficiaries of various economic developments, including the fossil fuel-based developments that underpinned that, that good life that um, Bessner was just talking about. And, the, um, and these, of course, are causing the climate crisis. Others in the global south, meanwhile, have been asked to bear the burden often of environmental harms. And here we can think about extractivism, but also the factory of the world um, and certain burdens of manufacturing of a particular kind. 
Less remarked upon, but equally important, is the, the fact that many Global South nations have also been asked to bear the burden of environmental care. And that can be typified by the functioning of carbon offsets. So there's a recent book by Laura Martin called Wild by Design that is a fantastic history of ecological restoration that shows how lands, including across the Global South, indigenous lands, became designated sites of ecological care work. And this produced new problems. It has coincided with massive land dispossessions and enforced a kind of anti-development that many point to as hypocritical and as authorizing environmental degradation elsewhere. So this is the kind of asymmetrical world in the present. And my work historically um, has tended to emphasize part of this story. So while I care about care, we can, we can come back to that. I think it's important. I have often focused on the harms and these have flowed frequently from this intersection of expansionism and environmental management and perhaps contradictorily so. So in the global interior, when I was looking at the interior department, a seemingly inward looking arm of the government concerned with natural resources and Native American affairs, I revealed itself to be an underappreciated arm of US empire and not only continental expansion in the 19th century, but also in the 20th century. And we saw this uh, skill set be applied in different contexts, including to kind of build on the terms that Aaron and Danny have nicely set out, the pointless empire through the management of colonial spaces beyond the contiguous the United States uh, itself, the product of ideological and material work over time. So this is when in the 1930s, the department became the home of the division of territories and island possessions and later the office of the territories. And I mentioned this more to kind of sync with this provocative framing about empire after 1945, because on some level, my, my book is a story of continuity as well in the, the kind of lead up um, to that, uh, I'll, I'll say the American century, but the kind of global hegemon status that is functioning in conditions where the world is ostensibly and systematically um, dismantling formal imperialism. But what I saw was that these environmental managers who helped, um, helped in the story of US power overseas, that they were, um, were all too happy to work within foreign sovereignty to try to facilitate similarly asymmetrical arrangements. So I'll kind of come around to that um, with a few more examples. But Interior is one of many agencies involved in this, and that multi-agency effort is, I think, important to how these projects became legitimated. So thinking about international development as an arena of its activity um, has been useful for me to see the mineral agendas in places like Afghanistan, Bolivia, Colombia, Egypt, India, and many others that helped reshape landscapes at various scales while distributing the benefits and tolls of those developments unevenly. And while I track minerals, you know, thinking about other works, thinking about what I hear in Monica's forthcoming project about hunger, you know, agriculture and other kinds of resources are also really important to these stories. So where strategic mineral programs stood out to me is that, you know, leaders at the moment understood the perils associated with this or the shortcomings of them. And I think it took a little bit longer in some cases for the Green Revolution's perils to reveal themselves over time. Um, so leaders in the Interior Department in this moment in the mid-1950s understood that extraction did not yield long-term benefit to local communities and host nations precisely because this was a very capital intensive project that so frequently relied on outsiders to fund and facilitate the kind of mechanical side of the story that outsiders benefited disproportionately. And this cut against the express credo in Truman's point four program to dispense with the old imperialism, which he defined as exploitation for profit. And in the book, I look at how an earlier version of the, the speech actually um, clarified a bit what they meant by the old imperialism, which they described as exploitation of native labor for foreign profit. So kind of painting in that portrait of what asymmetry meant. It was raw material exploitation sourced through a kind of racialized labor regime. And what became clear in looking at these environmental kinds of actors is that um, benefits of imperialism 
around raw material extraction and racialized labor, they wanted to retain even after these global commitments um, with the founding of the United Nations, with commitments to self-determination, and they were finding ways to facilitate that. Um, so the second half of the book, I am looking at zones that you know, fail to fit into those political categories, and we might find it useful to, to reflect on ecosystems that were part of the global commons, things like deep sea mining efforts and the, the use of outer space. Um, I also look at the kind of intensification of interest in indigenous lands in the United States in um, the post-war years. But whatever these, <laughs> these stories are, they are certainly ones that show unevenness of differential benefits and tolls that derive from different kinds of developments. And numerous observers at the time were commenting on this. So the intellectuals behind the new intellect or the new international economic order, um, indigenous pan-tribal coalitions understood full well that the system replacing imperialism at this so-called end of empire continued to bear this colonial residue. They understood environmental degradation, among other things, to be a key part of that asymmetry as local lands, waters, air, and communities bore the mark of toxic tailings, polluting effluents, radioactive isotopes, and lessened biodiversity. So the push for self-determination was not just political and economic, but also environmental. And that's you know just some among many, I think we're learning from scholars in Schaefer. Um, so I'll, I'll kind of wrap that section up by just saying, you know, the material footprint um, of the United States at the, the kind of end of the American century is still with us in this kind of um, contemporary state of globalization. And um, I, I could think through this same problem by pointing to a new project that I'm working on. Thank you, Erin, for kind of framing it. What I would just draw out about this, um, this book, what I'm calling Earth Movers, Multinational Mining and Environmental Challengers in a Global Village is that of course, it's not just the state. <laughs> you know, we know this in in our accounts of the the sinews of American power after the mid century. Um, so I am trying to bring the focus um, that you know other scholars have done as well to multinational companies, but also NGOs that are working over um, the the sort of we're trying to fight for the power to shape them more than human world in line with different visions for what is what is best um, moving forward. And, um, and companies, the one I'm writing about, Amax, uh, which is kind of like the Exxon of its moment and was heavily invested in and derived enormous wealth from the Copper Belt in Africa, from Southeast Asia, from Latin America historically, was running into problems with decolonization, perceiving the, um, the nations across the global south that were insisting upon a kind of self-determination over their resources as a threat to business as usual. So among other strategies, they intensified in extractivism in industrialized nations in the US, yes, but also Australia, New Zealand, and Canada. So this presented opportunities to think through certain similarities between um, between groups seeking non-domination, between groups that wanted to be able to have consent and determine the shape of their material landscapes and their communities. But this is unfortunately also a story that conforms to um, what environmental justice advocates describe, where the community I follow in Colorado, a largely affluent group of people were able to say no, and that that no coincided with other communities around the world, indigenous and otherwise, shouldering certain environmental harms related to um, extractivism meant to power a new phase of globalization. So here we are with, to end this kind of discussion very briefly with the, the final provocation Erin gave us about thinking about where this empire and where this project stands now, the systematic, um, enforcement of asymmetries that we have seen related to environment are actively undermining attempts to create a sustainable future for, for all. And um, I, 
you know, if I had a slide, I would pull up the kind of two data visualizations about carbon emissions by nation. And there's one that circulates that visualizes carbon emissions in the present. And um, China tops this list and they show Asia as a block that seems to be like the largest collective emitter of carbon. The United States is, you know, a smaller share. So those break down to the United States at 5.4 billion tons and 15% of global emissions, China at 9.8 billion tons and 27% of net or global emissions. But of course, the leaders of places like China and other nations understood to be a part of the developing world insist that we must look at this historically. And when you do look at this historical visualizations, the roles are completely reversed. The United States undoubtedly in North America, the highest emitters, Europe, the second highest emitters, and China and Asian bloc nations are, um, are ranking behind that. So this is uh, showing the kind of challenges we've seen to uh, creating environmental governance that will um, account for these historical asymmetries tied to colonialism and the, the post-war era. Um, and, and to see how the United States has so consistently refused to sign on to more robust international accords and efforts on grounds that it's um, that developing nations are not pulling their weight. We know that this is a very fraught logic. So I'll I'll end too by saying the transition to green energy still has a material footprint and is something that um, presents challenges to um, extricating oneself from these imperial legacies, precisely because the, the kind of wind and solar farms that are needed, whose land will they fall upon? And the minerals that power these materials, whether lithium and cobalt or others, come from other people's lands. So um, the question of who gets to say no to mining, I think, is a really important one to hold on to moving forward. And the legacies of empire are um, threatened to be a part of that calculus once more. So thank you for letting me reflect on these issues and then I'll pass this over to Monica. Excited to hear from you. Wow, okay, so thanks so much to both of you. I'm just like writing, 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 um, kind of digesting, digesting. Um, Aaron, thank you so much for bringing us together. Um, and yeah, it's one of these moments where um, one appreciates Zoom <laughs> instead of feeling its tyranny um, because it can bring all of us together via um, all these different time zones. All right, so I actually um, have been thinking a lot about Aaron's prompts for a while, actually, and I told him that even before we started um, this event that I have lots of different thoughts. So I have them all written down. So I'm gonna read actually from kind of prepared remarks. And Aaron, I'm gonna start out by quoting you. <laughs> In his prompt to us for this round table, Aaron asked us to reflect upon, quote, the structure of the U.S. empire in the 20th century, unquote. And Aaron notes that, quote, more discussion is needed to understand how we should synthesize or connect histories of U.S. global capital, militarism, cultural imperialism, etc., to fully capture what the sinews of power were. And I couldn't agree more with Aaron on this point. This is always the challenge in front of empire. And rather than a simple diagnosis or descriptive schema of US empire that we could offer collectively, perhaps the more fundamental question is how can we constantly and vigilantly, vigilantly pay attention to how the dynamics of US imperial power shift, change, and move over time? So for myself in looking at the post-1945 geopolitical landscape, it's really impossible for me to extricate the global project of US imperial hegemony apart from the global demands for ongoing decolonization from both colonies and recently independent former colonies. And in my own work, I'm always invested in gleaning these larger dynamics from those who are experiencing it firsthand on the ground. So in response to Aaron's excellent prompt, I'd like to turn to a Korean peasant farmer named Chang Chung Sung, somebody I follow in my book on interrogation rooms during the US military occupation period and the Korean War. 
So Chang's rice paddy fields were located along the newly and entirely artificial drawn border of the 30th parallel in 1946. He enters my book and the U.S. military archive because in April of 1946, South Korean and U.S. military interrogators all go together as a group to question this one humble peasant farmer. Why? Well, Chang had sent up, uh, he had hung up a sign in three languages, which is phenomenal, um, Korean, Russian, and English, which said, beyond this house is South Korea. So the sign is really brilliant because did it mean that his house was in South Korea or was it in North Korea? And for me, this the story of Chang is really important here because this trilingual sign not only denaturalizes the 30th parallel, but it also immediately shows how the ordinary non-elite person on the ground was already understanding and navigating global geopolitics. So clearly Chang does not trust any of the occupying forces and his priority is to maintain ownership over his rice paddy fields in the immediate liberation moment um, from Japanese colonial rule. So for Chang, the stakes of post-colonial liberation, capitalism, militarization, along with ideologies around security, were utterly concrete and inextricably linked. Or we could listen to the Korean sex worker who was living around the U.S. military camp towns in the 1980s on the Korean Peninsula. And she would also say that the infrastructures and ideologies around capitalism, race, and militarism were interlinked. In fact, her own body was part of the infrastructure that supported these imperial projects. So for um, all of us today, as we reflect on how um, kind of US unipolar empire is perhaps in decline, there is no question about how US imperial militarization has become the everyday structure of people's lives, both in the US and beyond, which raises an important question about how the decline of US kind of unipolar global hegemony does not necessarily mean a dismantling or decline in the militarized everyday of people all over the globe. Here, we can also turn to activists who have been making these connections and linkages about race, militarization, and empire in both the past and in the present. Third world student activists who were creating and demanding ethnic studies at US universities in the 1960s and 1970s were already making the connections between a critique of US militarized imperialism and their interest in the decolonizing demands of the third world. And they were making these kind of possible linkages between um, internationalist uh, solidarity and also um, the kind of political crises they were seeing domestically. And today, activists involved with police and prison abolitionist movements in the United States and activists globally involved abroad, involved with anti-US militarization movements have also been working together. So what can we learn from a Korean peasant farmer and a third world student activist about paying attention to US imperial dynamics or of power? Or let me be a little more precise. Let me tell you what I think I've learned from those on the ground. U.S. post-1945 militarization has been an incredibly capacious crucible for U.S. empire. Often when we use metaphors or phrases to capture U.S. empire, we turn to spatial metaphors or descriptions because they are useful in capturing both the material infrastructures and the geopolitical ambitions of U.S. military empire. For me, for example, um, Bruce Cummings, um, The Archipelago of Empire, I find that extremely useful, for example. And so these, but these, um, these kinds of spatial or even ocular kind of metaphors, they're very bird's eye view. And um, I wanted to kind of think through, um, you know, how do we get at um, kind of pulling a thematic thread, let's say, about U.S. empire post-1945 that gets at how um, U.S. militarized empire is experienced by those on the ground. So for my contribution to this roundtable today, I'd like to think through how we might frame the temporal ambitions of U.S. empire in front of the challenges presented by demands for decolonization. And I'm hoping that this is another way to get at the everyday embeddedness of U.S. militarization. This is something I'm definitely very concerned about, right? Um, because if, if you were to be at 
Pyeongtaek, for example, which is where a new U.S. military base has been um, erected in South Korea. Um, the decline of, of U.S. empire doesn't necessarily seem all that concrete, right? So what's going on between um, kind of the everydayness of um, U.S. militarization and what we are seeing in terms of a shift to a, um, a more multipolar, perhaps, um, power um, and on the global stage? So I'd like to propose for us to think about how the notion of rupture becomes key to U.S. formations of empire. Whether wars of intervention, military occupation, or the nuclear bomb, the United States insisted that its intent was solely on rupture, an interruption precisely calculated to alter the course of events in the future. U.S. imperial violence, post-1945, is supposed to affect historical change in a moment through epiphany and all. And the site of rupture is either a person, a village, a society, a region, and to enact rupture on one scale is to affect rupture on all scales, supposedly. So thinking of the US as an empire of rupture is useful for me currently as I move from my first book project on the interrogation rooms of the Korean War to a project on political economy, agriculture, and militarization across the Pacific. In other words, the notion of rupture works both in terms of framing liberal wars of intervention, that is the hallmark of US global violence post-1945, and also in terms of the underlying logics of US capitalist development projects and the neoliberalism these projects eventually introduce. So as a collective exercise, I'm gonna pre present, if I have time, just very quickly, three portraits of US warfare through the lens of an empire of rupture. I propose that we can see the notion of rupture affecting the practices of US imperial warfare in three connected ways. And I'll be using my own work with the interrogation room and the Korean War to illustrate them. And, you know, <laughs> This is, um, I'm still working through this. <laughs> so um, nothing here is set in stone. And I'm just kind of talking it through. I um, just wanted to introduce it today to kind of see where, if, if it's at all um, useful for us to kind of run with it in different directions. Okay, so first portrait of um, US warfare of rupture. So a US war of rupture is supposed to be very brief and efficacious. And in fact, US imperial warfare presents itself as a generative and transformative force. And, and you know, as I was writing that down, I thought to myself, you know, this is really familiar to us perhaps um, and kind of resonant with kind of settler colonial violence, right? Because there's this idea that the encounter with the other in the crucible of violence kind of regenerates, right? Sort of the white male Americans. So I think that post 45, you know, US warfare really follows that kind of template. So what's very interesting about this kind of supposedly transformative kind of warfare is that it demands and needs evidence of its own efficacy and effect. And indeed, when I was working on my first book, I was faced with a very interesting puzzle, which is that after 1945, on one hand, you have a proliferation actually of laws of war um, after 1945 you also have the continued escalation of state-sanctioned mass violence, right? And yet in between those two, I, I just, I like suddenly realized that after 1945, no state officially declares war again, right? So what's what's happening with that? You know, when, so when the U.S. is now only mobilizing under the banner of occupation or counterinsurgency, right? Um, the the U.S. now, because this warfare is no longer a war, right, um, the U.S. must show evidence of an end product of its efforts. So the U.S. must hold up an individual on the ground as evidence of how it transformed that individual and society writ large via the crucible of war. And in my book um, for the U.S. during the Korean War, that figure was the prisoner of war, the figure of kind of redemption, right, um, via violence. And I just want to pause here and just say that, you know, this kind of um, redemptive, transformative uh, rupture that is supposedly happening through war always goes hand in hand with um, with 
the kind of shock and awe violence, right? Which is also another kind of rupture, right? Um, during the Korean War on the small peninsula, um, the same tonnage of bombs was dropped on that peninsula by the US as the tonnage of bombs that was dropped on the entire Asia Pacific Wars um, during World War II. Also, General MacArthur requested 30 nuclear bombs um, so that he could create what he called a cobalt belt, that he could just basically implode 30 nuclear bombs along the Yalu River and that it would create a kind of band, right, um, that the Chinese could not cross for however many hundreds of years. So, you know, the, the liberal warfare of rupture in terms of redeeming the individual subject and therefore society goes hand in hand with the rupture that is supposedly being created by um, superior technology and bombing, which is something that, for example, Marilyn Young has spoken about um, really extensively. Okay, the second part um, in terms of empire of rupture framework. Um, so here, you can probably tell I formulated this empire of rupture framework as a way to think through the United States and decolonization, right? So the US emphasizes its ability to affect rupture or massive historical and social change in front of the demands and visions of anti-colonial movements and revolutions. So if warfare is supposed to transform people or to transform a society's progress into the future, then we can see here how the conduct of war itself has now become the evidence of one's capacity for governance. So what I mean by that is that here, to wage war that produces new subjects, this is a mode of warfare that wants to declare itself as a legitimate form of governance, so that warfare is a form of governance and vice versa at this point. In 1945, the U.S. proposed the 30th parallel as the marker of what was supposed to have been a temporary divided military occupation on the Korean Peninsula, but it ends up becoming the hyper-visible marker of a seemingly permanent war of intervention. What we have to keep in mind is that actually the Korean War has not come to an official end, um, and the only thing that was signed and back in 1953 was a ceasefire. So we're actually officially in the 72nd year of this war. And, and I think this really um, illustrates how the US as an empire of rupture, um, this rupture is not how to say, um, uh, so for the Korean War to be in a permanent state of of warfare, basically. That's actually the whole point, right? It's not a mistake. It's not an irresolution, right? Um, irresolution actually is the entire point, is that rupture, that continuous rupture is the entire point because having war um, continuously on the Korean Peninsula facilitates all sorts of other kinds of everyday embedded militarization by the US elsewhere, whether in Japan and in, in terms of Okinawa or thinking about the larger Asia Pacific, right? Um, or even the, again, the base at um, Pyeongtaek. So here, and this is where, you know, this can come into Mary Dudziak's ideas about wartime, right? Um, just again, about how, how warfare itself it's clearly not a bounded event, right, um, as used by the U.S. Um, in post-1945, and I would say even earlier, but then it actually is a kind of structuring, kind of a reality structuring process, right, um, and that really leaves me kind of wondering, okay, well, what happens to that, right, um, as we move to a more multipolar um, world? The very last thing that I'll just touch upon, um, which I think kind of goes more towards thinking about um, a rupture, a notion of rupture that gets both at um, kind of warfare and also how capitalism is weaponized by the United States, is um, I see this idea of warfare, U.S. warfare as rupture to kind of be, especially during the Korean War, to be the basis for what we will later um, call kind of clean or precise warfare, right? So this idea that like warfare can be surgical, right? Um, I, I think that we can really see that also, um, that kind of discursive framing also in terms of um, neoliberal 
capitalist um, projects, right, um, all over basically by the time we get to the 1970s. And again, this is you know, I'm just going to be saying the word every day <laughs> over and over, but how the logics of the militarization, right, um, and the logics of neoliberal capital really um, are two sides of the same coin. Again, how can we really pay attention to that carefully um, as we're moving forward um, in terms of dismantling that in terms of the everyday? So those are just a few thoughts, um, and I'm really looking forward to our conversation and, um, and engaging with the Q&A. So thanks, everyone. Well, thank you so much to all three speakers. I, I, I really greatly enjoyed that. Um, why don't we open up to questions from the audience, but I would also uh, encourage um, all of our speakers to feel free to ask questions of each other and engage in conversation from there. So if you have a question, feel free to use the raise your hand and I will call on you. Uh, Nick. Hey everyone, can you hear me? Awesome, thank you. Those were three um, really, really interesting presentations. Thank you so much. I guess this, this question I have came a little bit out of um, uh, Danny's presentation um, and the point you made about not wanting to die for liberalism. Uh, and then it came back to me as I was listening to, to Monica's um, discussion of, of militarized violence of, of, of various types. And I was just wondering if, if, if both of you and if Megan has thoughts as well could, could comment on, um, I guess just the impact of the shift to an all volunteer force uh, over the course of the of the period that that we're talking about from 1945 to the present, and and what impact that has on, you know, going back to Danny's point, like what it means to what it means to die um, for the United States, what it means to put 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 the body on the line in that sense, but then also what it means to to do these types of violence in, in, in other parts of the world that Monica was talking about. It, it, it seems to me to be such an important shift, um, such an important turning point. And I just wondered if, if, it, if it feeds into your interpretations in, in any ways. Monica, would you like to start or should I? Oh, okay, uh, just briefly, I mean, <laughs> It's not a bad thing for militarism to insulate the bourgeoisie from the consequences of imperial wars. I, I mean, I think it's it's a pretty obvious uh, effect. Once you insulate the elites, the voters, for the most part, from the consequences of your actions abroad, you're going to be able to do more things. Um, and I, I think uh, th this was actually also connected, I, I think, to the larger, what I would term the progressive American approach to war capital P progressive, because I would say the fantasy of American war over the course of the 20th century was to make it more humane, more efficient, both in terms of lives lost, lost and money spent. Um, so I, I, I think you could just place the uh, advent of the AVF into that longer term history, going back to really the post-World War I period. Um, the, the dream is, and it's going to happen, I think, is just get rid of soldiers entirely, just have it be drones and robots and constant surveillance. That's really the progressive vision of war. Um, and I think this, oftentimes the American military establishment is, is misread as conservative, and it's very much not. It's very very linked to the, the the turn of the 19th into the 20th century's progressive movement, which is to make war um, more efficient. And I think that has been the trend in the so-called American way of war. Um, it, it used to be um, Russell, someone like Russell Wiley would have said, when you, when you sort of bring masses and overwhelm uh, the forces, and he was using the 19th century as an example, but I think there was a transformation in the 20th century, which is almost the opposite of that, which is a scientized war, a rational war, a technological war, and the AVF is part of that process. Yeah, Nick, that's a it's such an important point that you bring up, right? I mean, because it's like the U.S. Um, basically has decided, okay, you know what? Grief and death are really inconvenient. 
So we're going to um, we're basically going to privatize that. And maybe actually, Megan, you can speak to that because I actually feel like what you look at, right, in terms of um, corporations and that, um, and it's earlier in the in the century in a way, right? But that really sets up what we see. Um, the anthropologist Daryl Lee writes about this, right? About basically third world mercenaries, also, right? So we, you also have like the corporatize the private corporatization of the U.S. military, but you also have basically a, a whole system that's laid out in terms of. Um, uh, yeah, the third world mercenaries or thinking about extraordinary rendition sites, right? Um, so that, I think the um, the kind of, you know, even in the Korean War, this kind of, dull, in this interest of making the United States military seem um, <laughs> humane, right? Um, one thing that would happen in terms of interrogation, right, was that if the US interrogator was having a difficult time, let's say difficult, right? Um, they would send the Korean POW over to the, the South Koreans, right? Who were composed of basically kind of these paramilitary youth groups, right? And um, have them do usually kind of, for example, one thing they would do was um, rig up a, a phone, right? put the person's feet in water, put the phone electrical wire in their mouth and just, you know, basically electrocute them, right? Um, so they would do that a few times and then send them back to the US, right? So again, or we go to Philippine American wars, right? So I think the um, this kind of um, compartmentalization, right? Or, um, within a very elaborate ecosystem, basically, right, of bureaucracy and violence and corporatization. I mean, I think this, this, uh, we see that happening and developing all throughout the 20th century, right? But, um, but having that all volunteer force really begs the question of, okay, like, well, what is going on now, right? So I don't know, Megan, if you wanted to touch on any of that. I mean, really, I'm, my mind is just spinning with these really smart comments from, from A to B. I would just add that you're inviting me to think about the compartmentalization and the, the implied chains between sites of environmental harm in the kind of um, most dramatic visual sense and um, and the kind of inverse of that, the chains between environmental care. So kind of the logic of the carbon offset is that, you know, people in certain places of a kind of bourgeois set can comfortably fly on JetBlue and feel quite liberal or quite humane about it. Um, while, um, you know, under Bolsonaro's regime, but still there remain the, the kind of um, Amazon forest that must look pristine in certain ways. Now we can talk about there are actors who, desire certain forms of productive management from an indigenous perspective that also run afoul of the expectations set by uh, institutions that are professionalized, that are elite, that are um, outside and far. But the point that is consistent between harm and care in the environmental sense, which I think has echoes, but also you know different permutation um, with the like pace at which bodies are on the line in, in the context of um, war and um, and that kind of visceral violence is that the further the chains are between those two, the easier to authorize and to recapitulate and to escalate and intensify and not question and not have that kind of difficult political debate and engagement that is meant to be, you know, the work of citizens, the hard work of politics to, to set that straight. So thank, thanks, Nick. I didn't know how I, but after hearing this, this group, I, I'm really inspired, so. Great. Um, if nobody has uh, an immediate question right now, I actually would uh, would like to ask too. Um, and I think one of the questions I, I thought so much about as everyone was speaking through these different conceptions of power was the role of non-state actors in so much of this and how important people outside state apparatuses are to shaping those two forms of the uh, American century that that, that Danny pointed to, to at the beginning, both that material element, but also the ideological project too. I'm wondering to what extent that is, can we see that as a unique story of the US empire or is that something much more longstanding that we shouldn't see necessarily 
as an exception. Um, and then uh, after that question, I, I would ask Danny maybe just talk more about if the liberal internationalist vision, you know, the blob sort of approach to foreign policy has dominated for such a long time, what is the policy of restraint that you sort of start to lay out in Empire Burlesque uh, begin to look like? And how does it deal with some of those issues that uh, Monica and Megan pointed to of long-term inequalities, rupture, uh, those sorts of issues? Danny, do you want to go ahead, actually? Uh, uh, sure, yeah. That last uh, question. <laughs> yeah, yeah, sure. Thank you, Monica. Um, I, I mean, I think restraint is such a rear guard action. Um, I think the, the U.S. empire is so gigantic. All, all we can really hope for in this historical moment is to maybe have it do a bit less. Um, I, I don't think it really addresses the, the fundamental structural issues of global inequality and particular north-south divide. I mean, if you take the last 500, 600 years of history, it, it, it's basically North exploitation and and, and um, just for lack of a better phrase, rapacious exploitation of the global South writ large. And there's lots of complexities in that story, but from a macro historical perspective, I think that's broadly accurate. And I don't think restraint can really address that. I, I mean, I think these the idea of U.S. empire is so hegemonic, and I still think the material basis of empire is hegemonic, that this is a generations-long project at best. And I mean, frankly, I'm pretty cynical about it. I don't think there's going to be the changes. Um, I mean, now I'm speaking as sort of just a person in the world and not as a historian, but I really am I'm very skeptical there'll be necessary changes made to consumption and, and carbon consumption in particular, and people in the North Atlantic just consuming an incredible amount at the expense of the entirety of humanity, um, that I'm quite pessimistic. Uh, say I'm also pessimistic about China taking a different developmental path and not based on consumption and the same for India. I, I just don't know what the, what's going to happen in terms of those larger macro historical questions. Um, in terms of non-state actors, uh, I mean, I think that they're quite crucial to both parts of the American century. And in particular, I'll just briefly mention, I, I really focus on parastatal actors, like what is a weapons manufacturer? You know, what is the RAND Corp? Corporation or other thing thinks like yeah not not every single client is the U.S. government but quite a lot of the client uh, um, their their largest clients often are um, so you have these sorts of liminal institutions that aren't you know technically public but they they perform what I would say are properly public functions and their major contract is the U.S. government that really defined the American centuries in all of their aspects so I think non-state I mean, you could even put them in like, quote, non-state actors um, are, are very crucial. And I think one of the most exciting spheres of research is um, when it comes to U.S. foreign relations history or foreign affairs, broadly speaking, is mapping out the national security state and, and how it relates to other states um, with, within the United States writ large. And I, I think actually sets the tone oftentimes of um, how the American state writ large will function in other non-security areas. Uh, I think security is so fundamental to, to both the subjective and, and even in some ways objective position of the United States in the world that it often serves as a model for other state um, functions. Not always, um, but sometimes. I might hop in on the non-state actors question um, briefly and say that, you know, I've been really struggling with this and characterizing two different kinds of non-state actors, the multinational corporation and the non-governmental organization, one a profit-seeking institution, one an often not-for-profit entity. They do not respond to a broader multi-constituency electorate, but they are accountable to their, you know, share shareholders on the one hand, or maybe voting members of the association. But we know that they're um, otherwise operating in line with a very different set of priorities than the political bodies that um, that we have been describing a bit more centrally in our conversation and with good reason with you know the the way that state power has shaped the American century and been critical to the functioning of empire you know in conditions of formal imperialism and in the <laughs> You know, other people can can use the terms that are probably you know I'm I don't um, I, I don't know like global hegemon I know is and it's unsatisfying to me too and it's it's not that empire is done so um, we can continue that conversation 
But to, to kind of bring this back to the question of environmental governance, there is you know, a critique and an awareness of multinational companies as empire builders, and they are not separate from state power, and they are also not armed in the state same way that states are. Um, but the, you know, so it's difficult to disentangle them from state power, but to see that very often corporations enact scripts that are set, these kind of scale making projects that maybe the state is involved in actioning. Sometimes corporations demand the scripts and kind of prompt and prod governments to do their bidding. But rarely is it, you know, is it the case that it is in always and everywhere the same iteration of the project. So this is where some of the theories that we have for understanding war and imperialism have um, left us, I mean, it's kind of shuttled it over to the historian's problem to say, well, there's contingency to the shape of, you know, when when private capital is leading and when um, when state interest is leading. And it becomes all the muddier with recent scholarship, really inspiring and, um, and important scholarship, I think, that is pushing across the East-West divide or looking beyond the socialism capitalism debates to see the the kind of shared substance between projects of scale so like I think of Victor Sio's recent work carbon technocracy which shows using Fushun in um, former Manchuria a space that had come through very violent projections of power under control of many different kinds of regimes some of which were socialist some of which were capitalist and yet the the constancy of the way that that coal um, source was developed as a, a massive large scale project, one to support a vision of um, you know private profit, the other to support a kind of abundance, a collective abundance that was meant to um, fulfill the promises of socialism. And I don't think you know it's not the case that people are conflating that, but noting the kind of noting the existence of these different kinds of statist projects calls to mind that the the capitalism of it all is is part but not is like a key part of the story but that it's also not the same and I'll end by noting in that kind of 1970s moment the UN conference on the human environment what really struck me in looking at these archives is that corporations and um and NGOs had a shared status, right, at the United Nations. They're observers, they're not key participants, they don't get to give speeches. And I see in corporate records this sense of deep paranoia that they are being labeled as just another NGO, even as they are a completely different kind of entity, um, a differently resourced and totally differently powerful entity. And yet I think, you know, we're, as we talk about non-state actors, we'll have to deal with, um, you know, populating a, a wide canvas and then seeing while their their resources are different to hear Monica's story about the everyday where like a youth program can be so easily enfolded into the most dramatic forms of, of personal violence. It's, um, it's the case that uh, we do need to take them all equally seriously while, um, while addressing some of these challenges of scale too. So, Monica. Oh, these are these are great. Um, yeah, what what can I add to that? Um, you know, I think um, maybe one one thing that like I I wonder what's going to happen with in terms of U.S. liberal internationalist discourse, right? Is um, in terms of non-state actors is its valorization of the individual, right? And by, and that kind of systemic and systematic kind of valorization of the individual um, and kind of moralizing the individual, the US has been really successful basically in front of um, demands in terms of decolonization to make, you know, um, the project of redistribution, um, justice, and reparations to be only solely on moral grounds, right? And not about economics, right? Not about economic justice. It's not, or, you know, even in terms of like 
in terms of climate crisis, that this is not about economics. We can only talk about it in terms of like solely abstract, right, um, kind of moral grounds. And so I, I really wonder, right, like how um, if there's a way um, for for that to, I guess I think that is, has been discursively like like the linchpin, right, in so many ways of what has um, been the foundation for justification and legitimization for U.S. Um, militarized um, projects all all over the world. So. So once once the um, valorization of the individual doesn't exactly hold the same water, um, our our collectives are going to be able to really take up these questions again about economic justice, right? So that's at least for me one one thing that I've been thinking a lot about, and um, and you know a lot of activists all over the world are working precisely on that question, right? So, but thanks, Aaron, for that really great question. Well, yeah, thanks to all three of you for uh, your thoughts on those questions. Um, do we have any questions? Um, oh, Tony, please go ahead. Yeah, hang on, I'm just... Uh, <laughs> I can hear you now. Yeah. I was trying to get on screen as well, yeah. Uh, thank you. No, I very much enjoyed all of those presentations. And obviously you're dealing with some very broad ideas there, mainly to do with non-state actors. Can I just bring you back for a moment to state actors uh, and, and the relationship between everything you're saying and the broader theme and key actors uh, in uh, more orthodox view of US foreign policy. Let's take, um, there's been a mention of uh, Trump and also of the liberal internationalist attitude. Let's take someone like Obama, you know, a very intelligent uh, president, uh, a liberal internationalist, generally speaking. Um, are, are, are the sort of um, ideas and problems that you're uh, talking about and trends and so on, uh, do you think that he 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 would have any uh, sympathy uh, with what you're saying? Uh, is he really just a prisoner of the system? Where does someone who I think most of us might admire uh, and his outlook and his eight years as president uh, and his pivot to the uh, Indo-Pacific, which was obviously a sign that he didn't think that uh, America was necessarily in terminal decline, where, where does uh, quite a specific but important state actor like him fit into your interpretation of um, the decline or otherwise of the American century? Sorry, do you mind repeating that? You cut out for a second on my internet. I, I apologize. Yeah, well, my last part of that was where does someone like... Uh, Obama, his eight years as president, um, his pivot to the Asia Pacific, someone that I think uh, is is much admired amongst liberal internationalists, at, at least. Where does he fit into uh, uh, this? Is addressed to each of the panelists. Your interpretation of this uh, decline or potential decline of the American century. Uh, I, I'm happy to start. I feel like I've been starting. Um, I, it's interesting. I, I wrote um, a big piece on Obama's foreign policy for Jacobin. So this is something that I've considered quite a bit. I mean, I think he's a typical chauvinist American imperial president trying to keep the system going as much as humanly possible. And, and like his economic policy, I think one of the great failures of his administration is that he wasn't taking into account the material transformations that basically reshaped how the United States will be able to interact fundamentally in the world. Um, and, and in terms of executive power, I think he actually was disastrous in basically solidifying the Bush administration's trampling on, on the norms of executive privilege and the um, 
and, and uh, basically legitimizing John Yu-esque approaches to executive power, which I which I think are profoundly problematic. You know, famously the Tuesday kill list that he would he would review every week to determine where to send drones. The 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 continuation of the Afghanistan war. Uh, you know, just just another few billion dollars, just another year. Um, I think he was pretty dreadful on U.S. foreign policy. And if you actually read his memoir. He also had what I would say of, 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 of sort of an affective relationship to the global South that was just embedded, embedded with notions of American exceptionalism and American historical guidance that I, that I just think is, is sort of the negative consequences of the material realities of U.S. empire. Um, I do think agents have a role. I think it's very difficult to become president and not believe in the American empire. To me, that's almost impossible. Um, and I mean, I know you didn't ask that, but Trump, same thing, you know similar caretaker of empire president for the most part just getting rid of sort of the niceties of some surface liberal institutions that that you know were basically he got annoyed because china tried to throw its weight around and only the us is allowed to throw its weight around so he 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 left those which i think just shows that like they weren't ever I'll just end on this. You know, it's like Rousseau and the Holy Roman Empire. The liberal international order wasn't particularly liberal, wasn't particularly international, and wasn't particularly in order. And I think we, 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 that's really the truth of the history of the last 70 years. <laughs> Thanks, uh, Monica. I'm seeing your gesture as a, um, a, a good prod because I I am kind of stuck in this thought and I don't think that I'll <laughs> find my way out of it without some uh, helpful gesture. Um, Tony, thanks for your question. I am stuck thinking about the many failings of the Obama administration relative to climate policy and environmental governance and um, in the kind of eight years of his presidency and the kind of question that I'm asking myself, thanks to you, is, is that structure, is that individual? And I do think we're seeing some moments of, of um, pushing through this logjam according to, you know, if we take recent headlines seriously, I don't think it's a huge paradigm shift, but you and climate negotiators are finding ways through this kind of 30 year blockage about compensation toward, um, global South nations out of a recognition of the asymmetries of history. And this is not something that seemed politically possible in Obama's terms, or certainly Obama was not one to make waves by um, parting with the, the kind of layered thinking on this, because it does be, you know, Bush is a part of this thinking and Clinton, and it's not just Obama who carries forward this kind of very selective memory about where and how um, the standard of living that the United States enjoyed emerged. And, you know, so as we know that I, the caretaking of empire, um, Danny, I think is a really appropriate term for, for someone like Obama. Um, and with that, a kind of um, a regeneration to build from Monica's frame of the exceptionalist mentality that the United States is um, morally superior in all of these ways, but also somehow environmentally superior. Uh, so it's kind of NEPA, it's, it's environmental legislation at a national level is something that people you know, hold onto in the United States in this way that's kind of enchanted like the idea of Amer um, the national parks are America's best idea, <laughs> as though you can extricate the parks from legacies of dispossession and and even genocide um, toward native peoples. So it's not a break or a departure, it seems to, to kind of look at the Obama years, certainly a, a stultifying political situation, not unlike the early you know, difficulties with different Congresses refusing to um, provide proper support for, for these international uh, treaties, but, um, but certainly the kind of neoliberal assumptions that the market must be you know, preserved, protected, and intact um, held true in the Obama administration in ways that I think not because of Biden as individual figure, but as a result of social movements and all kinds of groundwork, the kind of everyday work that Monica has signaled, um, seems to have presented a different lexicon and a 
more potent vocabulary um, for, for shifting this debate slightly. That's my reflection on this thought, but I am still kind of caught in it. I, I'll stop myself there. And uh, yeah, thanks. Thanks, everyone. Yeah, I guess that at this point, I'm just kind of hopping on, on the train. <laughs> um, so o Obama was just a, a clear U.S. exceptionalist. Um, and when you look at his particular record, I mean, Tony, you mentioned, right, the pivot to Asia, right? So that pivot to Asia was essentially, I mean, it's like classic Cold War <laughs> legacy of like, let's like hyper militarize the quote unquote every day in order to supposedly prevent future war, right? Um, only we're now going to do that vis-a-vis -vis China, right? But we're not going to talk about like China specifically. Right. So so he, he's doing that. And, and at the same time, um, like what Danny was mentioning earlier about drone warfare, I mean, the, the his use of drones, I mean, they I mean, that just kind of completely es escalated. Right. The, right, Danny. I mean, it was incredible. And actually, hand in hand, um, he's also being called the deporter in chief um, by, you know, uh, different um, activists on the ground in terms of uh, immigration policies and migration policies, right? So you're, you're going to give DACA, but you're also going to, right? So in, in some ways, he really highlights that very third part of kind of rupture that I was talking about, this idea that you can be precise, that warfare can be precise and surgical, right? So same thing here, you know, deportation is like, it's like surgical, you just like remove all of that. And that that's inconvenient. Drone warfare is surgical, precise, it's, it's not morally cloudy, right? Um, and something like the Asia pivot, right? Um, again, it's all this kind of discourse that actually is is very I would say consistent um, with everything that's that's come before actually so we don't have a break actually with um with, with what I would say with looking at George W. Bush right in terms of foreign policy and then what we see with the Obama administration but thanks for for that that question no sure uh, thank you Danny I know you have to head out um but let me just say how much we appreciate you coming to to, to the panel so thank you Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Uh, and I will see you all soon. Bye. Bye. Um, May and Mari, if you're okay to stick around for the last few minutes of the panel. Great. Uh, so Bill, do you want to ask? Sure. Yeah. Uh, thank you all. That was a really fantastic set of talks. Um, really thought provoking. Um, I'm going to ask something from a Latin American's point of view, really. Um, and, it, and it follows on from the comment about Obama as deporter in chief in a way that from a Latin American perspective, the dream US president seems to be somebody who has, is unaware entirely of the region. And so th th this was why when Trump acceded to the presidency, there were, there were half joking, half serious cartoons all across the region saying, well, this guy knows nothing about Latin America. Great. We might have a quiet four years. Um, and actually the interventionist policies towards Latin America, even the ones that are very lauded have, have often been pretty disastrous. And I wonder whether that's a, a place where, I mean, it seems like a very negative thing to hope for, but that's a place where we could, we could try to situate um, possible respite because even though Trump was pretty disastrous for Cuba US policy, for the rest of the region, there was all kinds of political developments went on and economic developments went on in Latin America without a great deal of direct US government interference. I mean, obviously there was some kinship between Trump and Bolsonaro and their, and their uh, various fail sons, but um, you know, that, that is inattention uh, as good a medicine as anything else. Sorry, I'm just I'm making some noises over here in Madison, Wisconsin, thinking to myself, Bill, like when you were talking, I'm like, oh, my God, is this like, like our strategy has to put in like a strategically idiotic, you know what I mean, person <laughs> in the executive branch as a way to implode U.S. empire, right? It's like, um, uh, I mean, you know, hell, maybe, maybe that is the case, Bill, right? And I wouldn't 
put it past the Latin Americanists to come up with a really good strategy for that, right? You know, um, yeah, it's, you know, I, I mean, not to like talk about freaking Trump, <laughs> like, again, but um, it was interesting with Korea, I have to say, Bill, because um, there's no, you know, he would do that tweet that he has a larger nuclear button than Kim Jong-un, right? So he does that, but then because he loves the the kind of narcissistic spectacle of um, high diplomacy, right? He was also talking about actually signing a possible peace treaty, right? And so this really put activists in a weird quandary, right? Where there seems to be a strange opening, you know, made by basically like a fascist, right? Um, and and should should they should they try to you know grab this moment structurally, right? And um, so I I. I, I mean, it's a really great point about what you're saying about Latin America and um, and, and, and Trump, right? Um, I I I wonder. I don't know, Megan, if you have other other thoughts on this. I mean, it's it's one of I think for for me what this brings up, which I talk a lot about in my undergrad classes um, on American foreign policy is just like how significant it is. Oh, hello. <laughs> how significant it is um, that over the course of the 20th century, and, and then especially post 45, right, that foreign policy really becomes the realm, right, of, of the executive branch, right? And so if, and which may then beg the next question of, Okay, if you know the U.S. is not going to be as unipolar global hegemon as before, does does the kind of purview, like the the extent to which foreign policy is the purview of the executive branch, will that change? Right, um, and I I don't know, right? Um, but I think that's a it's a good way to reflect actually on that um, huge question. But yeah. Um, Megan, what what are I would just point back to <laughs> I, I'm just thinking of some of your terms from earlier, Monica, that I'm really sitting with about the trust um uh, that is lacking in and through um, you know, the the evidence of the everyday ongoing force of US militarism in Asia or the lack of trust that any official with you know these kind of espoused liberal progressive principles could have anything other than a bluntly interventionist and problematic relationship to Latin America. Like there is no, there's like a shared substance between the um, the the kind of intergenerational memory and the presence and the hyper presence in the present day of um, of those failures, the hubris, the um, narcissism, and something like, <laughs> yes, uh, to, to kind of carry that question over to environmental disaster, like the, um, the idiot in charge or not, there are still corporations working out the means. And I think that gets to a shared story too, with um, contractors and all kinds of, of highly <laughs> capable or intelligent hawks or um, people who are hawking goods or doing other actions that are harming people and environments um, that that carry forward. And I understand the the kinds of um, yeah, the the pageantry of foreign policy is now what I'm left with and thinking about that really smart comment, Monica, too. The pageantry changes, but some of the things on the ground seem not to change too much but I you know the Latin America case I'd be I think that there's so much to learn from that Bill and I'd be happy to to hear examples if you have some in mind too. Thanks very much um I mean I'm not picking on the U.S executive here I mean I, I, I think generally any president who does very little will likely be the best president for a very long time in any country so okay. <laughs> oh no you can go ahead and pick away it's all right yeah, <laughs> like, <that's laughs> a bit. yeah definitely <laughs> Great, thanks, thanks, Bill. Uh, does anyone have a final question? Okay. Uh, oh, sorry, uh, Edward. Yeah, go ahead. 
Hi, it's more of a sort of a question about sort of environment. Uh, you said that uh, a lot of it, if you look at, you know, today, the biggest emitters are China or Brazil or these kinds of things. But um, if you look at it and before it was more the U, it would be more the USA. But mm -hmm. I mean, if you look at it more closer, a lot of, um, you know, corporations that are involved in, for example, deforestation and, you know, things like that, or even in Chile, you know, mm -hmm. they're mining materials for lithium batteries, which are, um, you know, extremely har harmful to um, to Chile's environment. Mm -hmm. And all these are U.S. corporations, um, mm -hmm. you know, and U.S. corporations also have a history in Latin America and things like that. So I, yeah. I know, I guess I'm raising more of a point, but I mean, mm -hmm. uh, couldn't you say there's still quite a lot of similarities in, you know, in the past with today and, you know, in, in that sense as well. I totally agree with you. I think that's a really great point and that there's so much to, there. there's a multi-dimensionality to environmental problems that the carbon emissions visualizations don't capture either because, um, you know, it, it's not talking about nuclear legacies. Speaking of the militarism that has pulsed through this, a very important conversation that that falls from view, the kind of um, profile of toxins that stem from, you know, whether we're talking about forever chemicals um, just through our consumption or um, toxic tailings that yield incredible and diverse damage to human bodies and uh, alongside the the non-human species that inhabit these spaces too. Um, I think there's there's so much ongoing accumulating violence and one framework, Robnick's and slow violence is very useful for addressing the difficulties of um, kind of precipitating action when the the crisis is, maybe incremental, maybe it happens not over the span of days or minutes, but across years and, um, and generations. So uh, totally, the, the extractivism continues and with the green transition is poised to continue all the more and will, I think, change the visualizations that are needed alongside the politics and the social mobilizations and, um, and the, the discourse to, to capture the asymmetry. And, and harness, um, yeah, harness it. So, thank you. Thank you. And thank you so much, Erin. Monica, I'm so excited for your new book. It's just, uh, this whole conversation has been a delight and I've learned so much. So thank you. Yeah, I wanna say thank you to, to both of you as well as Danny and thank you to everyone from the audience for uh, coming out tonight and being part of the discussion. Uh, we have future events posted on the Institute of the Americas events page. Uh, and I'll just say thanks to everyone for coming up. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Have a good evening, afternoon, morning, <laughs> wherever you are. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Are you are you teaching later today? Not today. Like, Wednesday is oh. the I'll start in then. And I can't wait for it. It's almost done. How about you? It's like you can <laughs> see the finish line. But no, also, you know. You just, yeah, it sounds like a great topic today that you have we're mentioning. Is that right? Oh, oh, yeah, yeah. I've got to, got to review what the hell I said last year. So, uh, yeah, <laughs> but, uh, but this was great. Aaron, thank you so much. That was this, like your prompts um, and your particular curating of us <laughs> was super, super effective. So thank you. Well, great uh, cat I, I, edition. Yes. Well, Bill, Bill's the king of the cat in the, uh, yeah. <laughs> in the photo. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's, uh, it's like, we're talking about the, the fall of us empire and the felines was like, yes, <laughs> so, we knew it's it a all. Very unruly cat. <laughs> <laughs> oh, great. Okay. Well, well, be well, everyone, Monica, congratulations again. I hope yeah. it gets less overwhelming and that you get space and time to Oh, thanks, thanks, thanks. And uh, hopefully, maybe at some point, we can actually cross paths in person, you know? Yeah, yeah Schaefer or something like that at some yeah, point. Totally. Uh, yeah, totally. That would be yeah, great. Yeah, I, I would really enjoy that. And and let me just say again, thanks so much. Like, the concepts you were talking through were helpful for my own work. Um, and just, uh, I think, a real benefit for us here. So thanks to both of you for taking so much time for this. Good. Well, good luck, everyone, on the projects, and <laughs> thank you. Yep. All right. Bye. Take care, everyone. Bye. Bye.